Hi, friends. Susan Blackwell from The Spark File here to let you know that the doors are open for The Spark File Illum, a nine-month group creativity coaching mastermind that invites you to be the chief creative officer and chief marketing officer of your creativity. But what does that mean? That means in nine months in Illum, you will clarify and advance your big creative goals and learn how to effectively share your work with the world. Now, if you're listening to this and you're an experienced creative or an accomplished professional who seeks a space where it is safe to attempt something you've never tried before or complete a big creative project or take your work to the next level and acquire the skills needed to share your creative work with the world, Illum might be right for you. We are calling in emotionally intelligent, high-functioning creatives who are ready to level up. You can find out more by going to thesparkfile.com slash Illum, but do it now to find out if Illum is right for you and to save with early bird discounts. That's thesparkfile.com slash Illum. Take a leap, take a risk. Go to thesparkfile.com slash Illum and join us for Illum. The Sparkfile podcast may contain profanity and other adult content. Please use your discretion. When I bump into something that inspires me, I dump it in my Sparkfile. To be something that I want to make or how I want to be. I pump it in my Sparkfile. I jump into my Sparkfile. Welcome to the Spark File, your one-stop festival for creative inspiration. I'm Laura Cammy, and I'm Susan Blackwell. If you're an OG listener, welcome back, Sparkler. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome. You may be asking yourself, what exactly is a Spark File? Where do I get one? What do I file in it? These are such good questions, and we have got answers. A Spark File is a place where you consistently collect all of your inspirations and fascinations. Here's the deal. We're makers. We make all kinds of things. And if you're anything like us, and you're making stuff all the time, or want to be making stuff all the time, you know the wellspring of inspiration can run a little dry. So we're on the lookout for fresh ideas, images, and inspiration that spark our creativity and pique our curiosity. Things that inspire us to get up off of our asses and make things like this podcast. Or a consistent practice that you, and possibly only you, believe in. I don't know what it is, but I love that. <laughs> or a festival celebrating the great voices of our past, present, and future. Mm. Every episode, we're going to reach into the spark file and exchange some sparks. And from time to time, we're going to talk to some folks who spark us too. And if you're not careful, you might believe the children are our future. Ooh. So without further ado, let's open up the, the spark, spark file. <laughs> what the heck? Oh, Camion. These are crazy times. These and crazy times call for crazy measures. Crazy intros. These are times, Camion. Suze, I'm just gonna can I just go right to the heart of it? Because it's the air, just Cams. on my mind. Say it. You know that I have been saying for quite a few weeks now that I wanted to do like a follow-up episode, a follow-up spark to my spark. Flu of, oh, yeah, of yeah. 1918. The big grape flu. Yeah. The great, the Spanish flu. The big grape flu is what the they call it. The grape flu. The big grape flu. Um, and I was going to do it like as all of this stuff started happening. With the coronavirus. With the coronavirus. Yeah. I was going to do this follow up. But lo and behold, things have been happening so fast and furious on that front. Like there's really no way to capture it. Like yeah. right now we are in the midst of late breaking news you know, every moment, moment yeah. to moment. Yeah. So, so I couldn't do that. And, and maybe I will at some point to find a way to do that, but we're just in the thick of it right now. So there is one thing that I came across though, that I found fascinating mm. and certainly related. So I thought that I would just, you know, acknowledge where we are mm -hmm. in this moment mm -hmm. and dive into this little spark. Okay. Yeah. Are you driving you straight good? in? I'm diving right in. So if you're listening to the news at all, you know that by now the very best way that you can avoid catching the COVID-19 virus 
or germs or any flu or other virus for that matter is to wash your hands. Wash your hands. Don't touch your face. Wash your hands. We started at our house when instead of like when you get off the phone and instead of saying to Nathan, I love you. I love you. We say, I love you. Wash your hands. Don't touch your face. <laughs> See, that's it. It's so and, simple. And I realize how wash much I, I touch my face. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Can't stop touching my face, but yeah. I have to stop if touching touch my face. If you touch your face, go wash your hands and let the cycle begin again. But wash your hands. <laughs> wash them before you eat, after you use the bathroom, as soon as you enter the house. If you've touched your phone or the TV remote control, just wash your hands. Mm. It's not panic like this is not controversial it's just simple just Mm -hmm. wash your hands Mm -hmm. um but as with all things that we seem to take for granted now there was a time when washing one's hands was not only not considered common sense promoting the washing of hands was outright scandalous and fighting for it cost one esteemed doctor his entire career yeah That's right. That's right. So it seems like so simple. Like, how could you argue with washing your hands? Many people did. So this information can be found in many places, but I got most of my spark from an article in National Geographic by Nina Stroklik, NPR, globalhandwashing.com, and Wikipedia. (laughs) Went straight to the source on that one. All right. So let me tell you a little story about a man named Ignaz Semmelweis. That name is everything. I knew it. I knew. I was like, as soon as I wrote that down, I was like, Susan's going to love this guy's name. I do love a good name. Ignaz Semmelweis. One S. (laughs) He was a Hungarian physician. So it's the 1840s. Okay. And Semmelweis was becoming more and more curious in this moment about why so many women were dying from what they called childbed fever. Like even in the most prominent hospitals and with the best medical care of that time, women, way too many women were giving birth and then contracting a fever shortly after and then dying. Yeah. And he wanted to figure out, you know, why, what the hell was happening. Now, keep in mind during these years, um, there's still a battle going on between doctors who believed that like bad air and evil spirits yeah. cause disease. Yeah. And those people who believe that doctors should have fact-based evidence-based knowledge, mm-hmm. you know, science. Side spark, the people who fought for evidence-based knowledge are a spark in and of themselves yes. because it was a battle bigger than we have any any idea of. And we may be revisiting it right now. And maybe the battle is still ongoing, <laughs> the battle right? The rages on. Right? So at the time, Semmelweis worked This at, is 18... Yeah. F- 1840s. 40. Is this yeah. Downton Abbey times? You know how we talk about putting it in the historical context? Is this Lady Sibyl? It's spoiler alert. It's a little bit before that, but okay. that, yeah. Okay. But it could still be going on. And you'll, and when I, as I tell you this story, you'll see why. Like it, that's what I'm going to picture. I'm picturing yeah. Lady Sibyl. Absolutely. I'm picturing Downton Abbey Times childbirth. Yeah. And where's he located? That works. He's in, well, he is from Hungary. Okay. But he is working at this time in Vienna. Vienna. In Austria. I'm picturing it all. Yes, picture it all. Vienna. This is all good I picture stuff. the sausages. Okay. I picture, yes. Interesting. Okay. okay. V- sausages. Yep. Yeah. Vienna. Okay. So here he is working at Vienna General Travel Hospital. Travel with us. <laughs> Travel with us. <laughs> with so many details. A detailed picture of sausages. I have to, it's so funny. We talk about this. This is the only way I can learn stuff. No, it's to essential. contextualize it. It's essential. I'm so sorry to interrupt you, though. No. Rock that's all on, right. Ignatz okay. Semmelweis. All right. Here we go. So Semmelweis worked at Vienna General Hospital in Austria, and this hospital had two different maternity wards. In one of the wards, the babies were delivered by male doctors, and in the other ward, babies were delivered by female midwives. Interesting. Very interesting. And could you choose? I don't know why. Uh, I I somehow feel like choice wasn't uh, so much (laughs) a part of things at that time. Maybe Maybe. social class, something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't know. Okay. Or it could go back to that science versus spiritual question. So if you were someone who wanted a medical doctor Mm -hmm. versus a midwife. But at that time, midwives would have been the people that for centuries had been 
helping women give mm-hmm. birth. Mm-hmm. So okay. we're speculating. We're really off road uh, speculation okay. here. But Look at us go. Here we go. So he started looking into this childbed fever. He discovered that many more women were dying who had given birth in the ward that was served by the male doctors. Mm. Women under the care of the male doctors were dying at a rate more than twice as often Mm. as the women who were being taken care of by female midwives. Eek. Eek, right? So obviously something's going on. Yeah. So he began to investigate a number of different factors that could have contributed to this statistic. He compared things like, was it A, the literal embarrassment of being examined by male doctors that could have caused the fever? Hmm. Wow. B, was it the fact that priests were presiding over them and did they, upon, you know, kind of waking up, see a priest and get scared to death? Like, did it scare the fever into (laughs) them? Okay, okay. C, getting a little more scientific, was it to do with the woman's body position during birth? Because women, I believe, that were birthed by midwives were lying on their side versus lying on their back. So he thought maybe because the approach was different and the her, the woman's position during labor was different, maybe that caused a change. But he looked into all those factors and not surprisingly ruled them out. I Can I just say, I don't think in the depiction of childbirth, I'm not a, I've never given birth to a child, but I've never in, in all the things I've seen depicting childbirth, have I seen a woman on her side? Me neither. Uh, but, but okay. But I suspect... That until very, very recent times, like the world didn't see pictures of that at all. Like imagine like yeah. even in our lifetime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah. was sort of taboo. Uh-huh. And you certainly didn't show a woman, you know, a baby coming out of the birth canal. Right. But times they have a changed. So here we are. Um, he he ruled out all of those um you know, all of those possible reasons and, and looked into more. But eventually he discovered a very big point of distinction that had to do with the schedule and the responsibilities of the male doctors. Turns out in the mornings, the male doctors assisted their students with autopsies as part of their medical training. (gasps) When they finished dissecting the cadavers, they'd head over to the maternity ward and deliver babies. The midwives, on the other hand, had no contact with the dead bodies in the hospital. They stayed in their ward all day. So a true break in the case came when a pathologist in the hospital got ill and died. Apparently, this wasn't a very uncommon thing. But in this case, the man had pricked his finger while doing an autopsy on someone who had died of childbed fever. Then he got sick and he died. And... Semmelweis looked into the pathologist's symptoms and saw that he had died from childbed fever. And this was crazy. This was like a because revelation. It was a man who had not a, given birth. That's right. To a child. This meant that childbed fever was not just something that women died of. It was something that other people in the hospital could get sick from as well. Wow. And in this case, it had transferred from the body, the dead body, to the doctor doing the autopsy, and he in turn could give it to someone else. Wow. So this was a revelation. Yeah. At at this time, remember that germ theory was still years away from becoming understood. So mm-hmm. the concept of germs didn't exist. They weren't mm-hmm. called germs. Mm-hmm. Um, but Semmelweis knew something was being transferred. He conjectured that cadaverous particles might be responsible It's essentially the same idea that like something so small that you can't see would be transferred from the cadaver, um, from the dead bodies to the new mothers by the doctors and students. Um, Unlike today, they did not require scrubbing their hands between patients or autopsies in this case. Wow. So they could take their pathogens or, quote, decomposing animal organic matter, as Semmelweis called it, from place to place and person to person. Wow. A few decades later, Louis Pasteur and Joseph Lister would introduce us to germs. We'll talk about that in a minute. So regardless of what you call it, Semmelweis believed that he had discovered the issue. So in 1847, he implemented mandatory hand washing among the hospital staff who worked for him at the Vienna General Hospital. 
And instead of soap, he used a chlorinated lime solution because it was able to fully remove the smell of decay that lingered on the bodies and the doctor's hands Ooh. after handling the dead fully bodies. Fully chlorinated lime solution seems like it would just like rip your skin off your hands. It seems like it might. Yeah. It seems intense. But it's sanitized. So after the team began sanitizing but, but themselves. What, what he was aiming for is it got the smell off. That's right. Because how else could you tell? If you couldn't see it, you didn't yes. know. But he assumed if you okay. could still smell it, it was probably it was still, present. still there. Uh-huh. So after the team started to sanitize themselves and their instruments, the mortality rate in the male doctor side of the maternity ward decreased drastically. Wow. Hooray. Hooray. Success. Yay for Semmelweis. He was very excited about this, and he set out to share this eureka moment with other doctors, assuming that they would care. Yeah. So, you know, they could develop best practices yeah. together. Yeah. So in 1850, he spoke at the Vienna Medical Society about hand washing. He gave an entire keynote about the benefits of washing your hands to a crowd of doctors, and suffice to say... It did not go well. Wow. It did not go well. The entire medical community rejected it. <gasps> no joke. Flat out rejected it. They questioned his science and his logic. And in subsequent years, historians have speculated that the theory was obviously going to be rejected because it put the blame on the doctors mm -hmm. for their patient's death. Mm. And of course, the doctors were not interested in taking on that type of liability oh, no. and responsibility. Oh, my God. So it was ridiculed so thoroughly that despite the fact that they had reduced the mortality rates in the maternity ward, Semmelweis's own hospital abandoned the hand washing oh, practice. Oh no! It had oh, no! It had yielded such good results. That's right. So uh, and and like and away it went. Uh, honestly, like to be forgotten for a hundred years. But we'll get to that. The rejection of his observations is often traced back to what they call belief perseverance in psychology. Belief perseverance is the tendency to cling to discredited beliefs, even when presented with new evidence or information. Aye. There's some fields of study like science and medicine where belief perseverance is the single biggest block to scientific advances. Wow. And that really struck me because of the world we're living in now. Yes. I do see a I little bit of... I am also struck by that. Yeah, belief <laughs> perseverance hanging on around here. Wow. So something to think about. Out. Um, so some of us had kind of some rough years after that, I would say. He left that job, he went back to Hungary, and again, he worked in a maternity ward. And despite what people thought of him, he introduced his hand washing practice at his new hospital. And again, mortality rates went down. Nonetheless, nobody gave him credit for it. No one connected it with the hand washing. Like, <sighs> Stop trying to make fetch happen, right? <laughs> Everyone was like, it's not the hand washing, yeah. so get over it. Yeah. Please stop talking about it. Um, in 1858 and 18... I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh. In 1858 and 1860, he published articles and then a book, including stats and information, along with his theories about hand washing, but still... No go. His ideas were still not embraced. In fact, many other doctors took the time to like condemn his work. Jesus. They touted their own theories for the ongoing childbed fever epidemic. Around this same time, interestingly enough, a nurse named Florence Nightingale. Yes. Also another spark. Side spark. She is. A, uh, I dug into her just a little bit with... In relation to rejected princesses. Oh, um, interesting. Yeah, she was interesting. Yeah, yeah. she's a whole, she's whole a spark, spark and yeah. deserves so much time. But she arrived on the scene during the Crimean War, which was between the British and the Russians. Yeah. And she was also extolling the virtues of hand washing. Mm. She implemented hand washing and other hygienic procedures in the war hospital that she worked in during that time. But again, it didn't take off any further. That was it. It's, you know, I'm sitting here and I'm like so aghast, but at the same time, it takes time mm -hmm. for evidence based knowledge to catch yes. up. Like it, it does 
It takes time. Well, also when we're talking about things that you cannot see. Yes. So it's very difficult but for people to... time is to, so precious if right. your loved one is the one with childbed fever. During these times, like, yes. uh, certainly hundreds of thousands of women's lives could have been saved. Yes. Honestly, if people had listened. To our dear friend Semmelweis. A few years later, his own health began to wane. Mm. Some people say he may have had Alzheimer's or dementia. Either way, he took a real turn for the worse. He began writing open letters to call out like other doctors by name. And these letters were just full of vitriol and mm. anger and bitterness. He began talking about like childbirth fever in literally every conversation that he got into. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, like his mind was fixated on that. Um, he started taking up with possibly living with a prostitute, much to his wife's dismay. Wow. And eventually he was put into a mental institution and he died not long after. Hmm. Died, sadly, not knowing, you know, what the contribution, his, the contributions yeah. that he made. Um, two years after his death, it's 1867, a Scottish surgeon named Joseph Lister also began promoting the idea of washing your hands and sanitizing your surgical instruments. Mm -hmm. Sanitizing your surgical instruments. There's a tongue twister Woo! for you. To stop infectious diseases. He faced many critics as well. Nonetheless, the idea started to take off a little in the 1870s as more doctors began to wash their hands regularly. Again, not out of a mandatory thing, but just, you know, several doctors were like, okay, I mean, worst case scenario, we're wrong about this. But worst we case could scenario, go ahead and our wash hands, our hands get a little chappy. That's right. Yeah. Um, Lister went on to become the father of antiseptic surgery. Mm. He was all about sterilization. Listerine antiseptic, yes. which was developed as a surgical antiseptic, but eventually became a mouthwash, was named after him in 1879. He went on to be a highly decorated surgeon with hospitals named after him, a funeral oh, in Westminster your, Abbey. There's your legacy. And the establishment of the Lister Medal, which was created to honor top surgeons after his death. And his work began where Semmelweis's work left off. Mm. Um, eventually, other people also started to recognize that they may have been wrong about Semmelweis's work. A doctor named Louis Pasteur. We know him. We know him. He ended up developing the germ theory that we now understand and, and became, you know, well known and accepted and changed how patients were cared for and how the cause and spread of diseases were investigated. He, of course, is the father of microbiology, invented the technique that would stop bacterial contamination, the process we call pasteurization. These are huge contributions to society. And huge. It's insane. Huge. He eventually created the first vaccines for rabies and anthrax. And, of course, he also used a lot of Semmelweis's data Man, he got as a lot done. the jumping off place for his work. Wow. And he is his own spark for sure. Yeah. But neither of these guys would have been able to do what they did. Yes. Were it not for our friend Semmelweis. They stood on his shoulders. They did. Yeah. They did. Um, if you can believe this, surgeons generally began scrubbing up in the 1870s, but hand washing, hand washing for all, yeah. did not become universal until one hundred years later. What? In the 1980s. That is in our lifetime, Susie B. Hand hygiene was officially incorporated into America's health care with national guidelines for all. 1980s. Wait a second. That late? That late. You're kidding me. I am not kidding. Now, this makes me want to talk to uh, Nancy Blackwell, retired registered yeah. nurse. I remember all through my childhood that her hands were always so dry and so chapped because she washed them all day long at work. And yes. that would have been in the, wait for it, the s late 70s into the 80s and 90s. Well, hospitals like, and surgeons took it on in the 1870s. I know, but what are and you saying? That the rest, the general public becoming like being encouraged to wash your hands 
Really? That's 1980s. It became part of like the handbook, the general guideline for good health in America, at least. Other countries may be different. Now, it sounds like, though, in the medical profession, they did embrace it. If your mom was washing her hands. But I'm also thinking like I'm thinking back, I'm casting myself back through yes, time yeah. to my elementary school bathroom. And I think we were always it was like you go to the bathroom, you wash your hands, you that's right I around feel, the time. I think it was. Well, <laughs> yeah, I'm, you're sweet. I, I mean, you're that, saying it's 70s. I'm not saying 80s. it's like 70s. Yeah. I Well, what I'm saying is on like multiple websites that show the history of like when I believe the you. health, the health. Is it agencies, sort of when, remember when we started to see like, po- like literally posters in bathrooms yeah. with pictographs of like, Here's how to wash your hands well. That, That's right. I, it's so it's that. It's that. So like push. our parents did not grow up with that, with those little signs saying of, wash yes, your hands. Of course, of course. That's all within our lifetime. Yeah. Not all of our listeners' lifetimes, but our, our lifetimes. Yeah. That's fucking batshit crazy. It's fucking crazy how long it took from. Semmelweis, oh Florence Nightingale, <laughs> yeah. Lister, yeah. Posture. Like, come on, everybody. Wash your freaking hands. Wash your goddamn hands. So more than 100 years after the medical industry mocked him and his theories, the Medical University of Budapest changed its name to Semmelweis University <gasps> in order to honor the man uh, who continued to insist on hand washing. Yes, Yes. I mean that healthcare really hinges on his on his like adamant. I mean it. Dro- I mean you could say it drove him literally crazy. It is the thing that will make the difference for us, like saving our lives. And now the so-called Semmelweis reflex became a term. It's a metaphor for a certain type of human behavior characterized by the reflex-like rejection of new knowledge because it contradicts entrenched norms, beliefs, or paradigms. Wow. It's named after Semmelweis, whose ideas were ridiculed and rejected by his contemporaries. So let me see if I'm hearing you correctly. Mm -hmm. The Semmelweis reflex Reflex. is when you have an existing belief, someone presents you with evidence that that contradicts that belief, and you're like, no, that's not how I know it, or that's not how it's been done. (gasps) I'm telling you the earth is not flat. Oh, it is flat. It is flat. I feel like he would dig having that hospital or like named after him. I wonder how he'd feel about having... (laughs) The reflex? Like a lifetime of rejection sort of summed up in a phrase like that. Well, I feel like it illustrates again and again what it to me it illustrates the resistance to new information. Fascinating. And I kind of love that they named it after him because that is all he experienced in his lifetime was a resistance to new knowledge. He had the facts, he had information, data, stats, whatever you want to call it. He had it all. And (laughs) Still, people couldn't. But I mean, we're really, really irresponsible with it, too. And people like I've been in meetings where like data has been presented, not about either of these topics, but just data has been presented. And the response is, oh, those numbers don't feel right. Like, well, they're not. It's not so much about how you feel about hand washing or how you feel about whether or not germs exist. It's scientific and we know that they do. So, you know, it's, um, it's a little crazy to be living in a time where we are, it seems like we're like going backwards a little bit. It's so fascinating and enraging, frankly. Enraging. So what do we make of it? What do we, well, well, I got a list. I mean, I don't know. There's a, there's a lot. First of all, wash your hands. We make a practice of going to the bathroom. Wash your hands. hands. Don't touch your face. Don't touch your face. Wash your hands. Don't touch your face. But if you're Steven Soderbergh, you might make a show called The Nick, which is about a fictional hospital around the turn of the century. It was on Cinemax for two seasons. Um, And 
I think there's way more room for more stories like this and explorations of, you know, how our medical practices oh, that's came to so be. Oh, interesting. And the time specifically, like his was a little bit after, but it was still, people were still struggling with it. But the time when medicine was still part of spiritual beliefs and part of science and how exactly science won out or whether or not we're still in the discussion about whether or not science won out. Um, but I think there's way more stories like people have an appetite for learning more about that. I think again, because they mirror this time that we're in now. Uh huh. Um, I think I'd like to create a moment of gratitude for the people who fucking stuck to their guns, trying to convince the world yes. of scientific evidence. In some cases they literally went crazy trying to convince people. Yes. Um, I'd like to make a practice of checking my Semmelweis reflex for any biases that I might be unwilling to re-examine. So good. You know, just checking. Are you stubbornly clinging to old ideas that no longer have any evidence to support yes. them? I mean, that comes up for me and my therapist all the time. She's always like, she's never called it that, but she will be like, be and, and if this she belief did. system, this particular belief, yes. how long has it been that since you've had any evidence of that? And I'm wow. like, oh, oh, good point. Yeah. She's a good one. <laughs> she, um, she sounds really good. You can make a game of washing your hands for the millionth time. Did you see that poster that was going around on social media? Um, supposedly it was from the WeWork offices, but they made a little poster that is a list and lyrics of six songs that you can sing instead of happy birthday to occupy that 20 <laughs> seconds while washing your hands. And it includes Lizzo's Good as Hell, but you sing it twice. Okay. Toto's Africa, <laughs> Fleetwood Mac's Landslide, The Killer's Mr. Brightside, Pink Floyd's Another Brick in the Wall, and finally, Beyonce's Love on Top. So you just sing the chorus two You just times. sing the chorus, yeah. And it gets you there. Just sing that. So I'd love to see everyone like, you know, let's, let's gamify, as you would say, Suze. Let's gamify the washing of our hands. Let's enjoy it. It's not panic. It's just prudent. Let's just wash our hands. Let's just wash our hands. My like, God. I want to add one to that that I'm just yeah. thinking. I'm like, how fast could we, if we just cleared the afternoon, how quickly could we get a t-shirt up on like Society6 that it's like in this beautiful, like just hipster <laughs> graphic just says, wash your hands and don't touch your face. Like, I That's feel it. like we could sell out. That's it. Do you know, cakes. do you know who is selling, um, merch like that? Oh, what's his name? Clorox um, swipes. No, it's a card. It's one of the Kardashians Ugh. exes. Kanye Lamar. I don't know. No, but it's what's his name? Anyway, he's selling merchandise already and he's getting the uh, the Kardashian ladies to model it, that of course, so that what? he can, that says wash your hands <gasps> and oh, something else. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sparks so already out there. Look at that. Yeah, wash your hands, don't touch your face. I think I'll be working on a new song, Ode to Similwise, as I wash the <laughs> cadaverous particles off my hands many, many times With per day. With chlorinated lye. That's right. Keeping it safe. Keep it clean, my is friends. It to, is, it to, is it sung to the tune of Edelweiss? <laughs> it could be. Semmelweiss, Semmelweiss. Every moment I'm washing. There we go. It just goes on and on. Oh, writes itself. Writes itself. It writes itself. Camion, that is That's a timely a spark. spark. You know what? It's been on my mind, and I was like, let's just dig into this. <laughs> Tell me more. We're gonna have to rush this episode. We're gonna have. That's to right. Close this soon. That's right. Or not. We're gonna be with this for a while. We shall see. Hey, let's take a break. Okay. The spark. Camille, welcome back. Thank My you. spark is such a different spark than your spark. Okay. My spark title is, and I can sing. My spark sources include the website of the Oakland Unified School District, the website Fords.org, which is the website of the Fords Theater in D.C. You know the one where Lincoln was shot by John Wilkes Ooh. Booth. And the HBO documentary, We Are the Dream, the kids oh. of the MLK Oratorical Festival. Kimmy, and have you seen this documentary? I have not, but I've heard all about it. And Bonnie Siegler told us about it because she worked on it. That is exactly it. right. You remember yes, she yes. did say that uh, Bonnie Siegler, who we talked to on our recent Maker Show, des designed the graphics for that film. This is a documentary 
that HBO produced. It's beautifully directed by a person named Amy Schatz, who I think would be a great yes. uh, person to have a conversation yeah. with on a make or yes. so. Let's do it. Um, but let's let's talk about it. Okay. You haven't seen it yet. I've not seen it, but I have attended um, festivals that were based off of the great. festival. Yeah. We're gonna we're gonna so talk, excited. We're gonna talk all yeah, about it. I can't wait. So um, the documentary "We Are the Dream" takes place in the city of Oakland. In the film, a principal named Mukta Sambrani from Lincoln Elementary School tells us that Oakland is a very. I have never spent any time there, so I don't. I didn't know a lot about it, but apparently, it's a very diverse town. It's known for its social justice. It's known for its activism. Mm. It is in close proximity to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's associated with the Black Panthers, who started in Oakland, which I did not know until I watched this documentary. But another thing that started in Oakland is the MLK Oratorical festival which celebrated mm -hmm. its 40th year in 2019 40th year 40th i year. had no idea how about that from the oakland unified school district website 41 years ago the founder of the dr martin luther king jr oratorical fest donald oliver had a vision he wanted to showcase students oratorical skills and he wanted to honor dr martin luther king jr now i just for a second want to say that's he, your person. You got two passionate sparks. You've got somebody who wants to showcase students oratorical skills. You want to honor Dr. Martin Luther King. You're like, how can I bring these things mm -hmm. together? I love how sparks blend and combine yes. to create actual creative self-expression. Something even more inspiring that exactly. will create more sparks. Exactly. Sparks on sparks on sparks. So Donald Oliver felt that testing and reading score data did not truly lift up students' comprehension and fluency skills and abilities. But he knew that delivering an oration was an academic exercise that required students to read, comprehend complex texts in order to analyze, synthesize, interpret, critique, and present or perform that text in a competition in public speaking. So, mm -hmm. so whereas testing and data and all mm -hmm. that stuff, they weren't maybe like, it wasn't, going so well mm -hmm. but he was like if it really comes alive that's right that's when things are really going to start to pop that's right this brings us to the 41st annual OUSD Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Oratorical Festival in which schools at all grade levels across Oakland have an opportunity to bring Donald Oliver's vision to their students so that's from their website what Can I ask you a question? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. they each, so they started it. Then schools can say, we want to do that. And they, each of the schools do it on their own or do they come together in a unified I'm one? I'm going to tell Ooh. you, you're going to love it. Um, for 41 years, they've been holding this festival as a school district. Okay. And wow. uh, it gives students, listen to this, from pre-K <gasps> all the way to high school seniors, a chance to speak in front of an audience and to use their voices. Oh. I'm going to explain to you how they structure it in just a moment. So the documentary, We Are the Dream, follows a few students and the adults who are helping them prepare for the festival. And that, so that's their teachers, that's their parents. Mm. It mm. <laughs> mm. Me in. Mm. I have full body chills right now. Oh, God. The whole festival is produced by a person named... Awele Makiba, who is an educator and a beautiful storyteller herself, she says, lifting up student voices is part of fulfilling Dr. King's dream of the power of oration, the power of the word to create social change. That's how we're going to create a better world for all. She also says, it's amazing what's coming out of the hearts and minds of young people today. Mm. They're profound and they're intelligent and they have a vision. And given the opportunity to share and to listen, there's so much to learn. Oh, that's so Awele true. Awele Makiba is mm. a, this is a person who I just feel like, yes, yeah, she's a person. She looks like a person. She dresses like a person. But I think <laughs> inside, she's fully automated by Sparks. Oh. She is just, she is it just seems like she is a remarkable oh, teacher. She's a remarkable, she acts as sort of the MC and the host for the big festival. Yeah. And she, I couldn't take my eyes off of her. Oh, she's incredible. really, really, I think she's super special. Oh, yeah. She's I really can't something. Wait to watch this. Yeah. Yeah. 
So from her, we learned that 800 to 1,200 students participate in the festival using poetry, both original poetry and published poetry, speeches, famous and not so famous, and monologues, right? So you sort Mm -hmm. of, you can choose, there's a variety of things that you Mm -hmm. can choose from. Mm -hmm. Another teacher named Ann Park from Bridges Academy said that their students participate every year and it gives them a chance to not only understand the power of MLK's words, but it also gives them a chance to understand the power of their words, how they can make a difference Also, Mm -hmm. uh, which I really loved because sometimes it's that beautiful, like crafted, established, published, right, you know, tried and tested language. And sometimes it's stuff that they've conceived of and that they've developed, which I think I I love that they're having that experience. That's incredible. So to answer your question, Cams, it begins with festivals at each individual school. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you perform at your school and you win, then you go to the semifinals, Uh wherein 48 schools send their top placing students to compete, totaling about 163 presentations. Wow. That's the semifinals. Then 64 of those presentations are awarded a blue ribbon. And they go on to compete in the big time, baby, the show, the district the finals. Big show! <laughs> the big oh, show! Oh my God. Those students, <laughs> those students, about 64 presentations, they are getting in front of hundreds of people. And it provides an opportunity um, for students whose talents may not, may not be highlighted in the classroom, mm-hmm. right? That's right. Um, one of the adults in the documentary points out, these could be future politicians or yep. writers. That's the purpose of education, helping kids to discover their own passions. Oh my god! But they're making space with this festival. They're making space for it sometimes outside of classroom hours. So mm-hmm. it could be something that they do after school. It could be something that happens on the weekends that mm-hmm. sort of thing. And if you're the type of student like you were Camion or maybe like I was or other people who are listening to this, who uh, this might be an unawakened passion or skill set that you have, That's right. this is providing an opportunity to access that and give you a chance to shine. Yes. Um, God, stu- that's exciting. Cam's, the students in this documentary, uh, I mean, let's learn a little bit about them. Okay. At the Piedmont Avenue School, there's a third grader named Gregory, and Gregory performs a tribute to the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., compiled by an educator named Zarita Sharp. Zarita Sharp coaches Gregory mm-hmm. through the speech. She gets him to relax. She's teaching him how to just breathe, to use his powerful oratorical voice, and also to let him know that those nervous butterflies, when they come, they will come. But when they come, to keep speaking, to continue speaking. And it's so interesting because you are seeing these young people (gasps) Uh, whose brains are not fully formed, and you see their brains growing in real time. You see them over the course of the documentary, getting better. You see them improving, which... It's so incredible because you're learning to deal with, on the one hand, the feelings that come up uh, when you're in front of people saying anything. These are, that's Mm -hmm. a set of feelings that can be pretty intense. Yeah. And that must be understood and conquered in some way. And then you have the set of feelings that you are intending to evoke that's right that in are moving, the piece that are moving through in addition you. to your adrenaline maybe some cortisol that's, that's right th- that you also have the feelings of dr martin luther king's words moving through you which that's is right. another which set of gives feelings me chills just thinking yes, about yeah and you're learning to navigate all of that and deliver yeah and wow. to to, uh, to get ahead of myself a little bit, you and I both uh, go into different situations, corporate situations, things like that, and we help people get better at public speaking and presenting. And if you want to get better at public speaking and presenting as an adult, watch We Are the Dream, because mm. a lot of the advice that they're giving to these students holds true and holds up well into adulthood. So good. It's it. Yeah. We've talked about this a lot. I 
firmly believe that every single person, no matter what your job is, would benefit from learning how to speak in front of a group of people. Agreed. 100%. Whether that's the five people that you manage yep. or it's a hundred people in the district office. Yeah, you know? I agree. Wow. Um, back to the spark. There is a boy named Karunyan. His mother and father are immigrants from Sri Lanka. His mother's father was arrested and disappeared 20 years earlier in Sri Lanka. Um, and Karanyan gives this impassioned speech about it, talks about his grandfather, talks about what if we had somebody like Martin Luther King to, you know, lead the way for us now. <laughs> Seeing his mom coach him, oh. seeing his mother and father's love and oh. pride for their son. And she has great advice for her son. Whenever he talks, let it come from his heart, oh. which is great advice. And I know that can sound very simple, but that's great advice that's for a great speaker. Advice. It's great advice. From Allendale Elementary, there's a student named Lovely. Oh. Lovely uh -huh. has been doing oratorical since the second grade. And in the 2019 competition, which is documented in the documentary, she performs a poem that she wrote herself called What You Know About. In the documentary, her father helps her prepare for the competition. And he talks about how he has lovely get up and recite her poem wherever there's an opportunity. So if he's shopping for clothes at his clothing store or at the barber shop, she's getting in front up in front of people all the time, which is fantastic <laughs> advice for any speaker, any orator, a stand up comic, an improviser. Get up as often as you can. Yes. Uh, lovely has some great advice for speakers too. know the words by heart, say it clearly and loudly so everyone can hear. And don't say it too fast. Oh, I was like, yeah, lovely. That's, that's exactly perfect. how. That's how you do it. That's how you do it. Uh, There's a young man named Donovan who shares a piece that um, was sparked by a news story of two African American men who were arrested while waiting for a business colleague in a Starbucks. Many of us know this story. In his piece, he says these words, which he wrote. Social media, if used the correct way, can be a positive and powerful vehicle for social change and justice. What if we cared more about gun laws than we did about how many followers we have? What if we talked to each other instead of commenting rude things about each other? Mm. What if we built each other up instead of tearing each other down? It's so, I don't know, heartening to me, inspiring to me mm -hmm. to see these young people, yes, doing the established writing, but also right. sharing things that they've written themselves, sparked by things they've seen on the news that they can't wrap their minds around. Mm -hmm. And so they have conversations with their parents and their That's teachers right. and try to understand it and then try to present it, get their arms around it yep. in a way that to helps them understand it, but also to use their words to try to impact change. I feel That's like right. it's everything. It's, it's all That's I want to do in life. I, exactly. Exactly. It's all I want to do. Huge. Yeah. And you, like you said, you are learning to communicate in a different way, in a way that is inspiring understanding and inspiring action yes. and change Yeah, as opposed to, you know, the, what they're referring to in the social media where like anyone can tear each other down, yeah. but can you use your voice to make a difference for good? I wonder, as I was watching it, I was like, as Donovan says these words, is it impacting? Like, is it, can the students who are all sitting gathered listening and even like their big brothers and sisters, mm -hmm. their parents, the teachers, mm -hmm. like, can they take it in? can't maybe it is making change mm -hmm. that is my hope mm -hmm. that is my hope my favorite mm -hmm. student mm -hmm. is an eight-year-old girl named madeline gabata who performs a poem in the solo competition there's solo competition and there's also yeah. group competition wow she performs a poem called in mis sueños by francisco alarcon she performs it in spanish and in english uh-huh uh <laughs> she is about as big as a minute. She is just, but Camion, she, she is so 
good. Oh. She is so grounded. She has some good advice for speakers. She talks about in the documentary, she said she was nervous before she did her poem, but then she took a deep breath and she relaxed. Mm. And I was like, yeah, Madeline, yeah. that's it. That's, and that's you should what see you her tell her poem. It is, oh. she's so good. And picture, if you will, Cami, and a gigantic, like the biggest high school auditorium you have ever seen in your uh-huh. life. Okay. The biggest, a big, dark, empty stage and a little teeny, tiny, three foot tall person <laughs> in the middle of that stage, just oh, owning it, just owning it. God, that's uh, awesome. So good. There's so much wisdom in this documentary. They have this fantastic footage of MLK speaking to young students and saying, however young you are, you have a responsibility to seek to make your nation a better nation in which to live. And as we were saying, you can see these students are just beginning to do that. Sometimes it can be rote. Sometimes it can seem like my teacher told me to do it this Mm -hmm. way. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But sometimes you see something else that's beginning to awaken in them and you see them making it their own. In this documentary, there's an 11 year old student named Victoria who says, Dr. Martin Luther King, he made a legacy. I may not be known. I may just be another kid in the world, but at the same time, I feel like I am somebody. So because of that, I feel like I have to give my best. I feel like I'm doing this for him. These students are inspired by Dr. King. I'm inspired by these students. It's just like a cycle of inspiration, y'all. The educator Winston Williams from Markham Elementary School is shown preparing his young students for a group performance. He talks about how the oratorical festival is an educational tool for him. It's an educational tool that he uses. He selects pieces that are going to teach something about African American history Mm -hmm. and talks about how in the sixties they fought to get more black history in the schools. And over the years since then, all the African American history has slowly been picked away so that there's nothing left except Dr. Martin Luther King. (sighs) So the oratorical festival gives the students a chance to ask questions about history, questions that don't come up in their school curriculum. That's right. So his students are doing a piece about Black Panthers. So they're getting to learn about the Black Panthers, which is from their town. That's right. Um, And Mr. Williams also has great advice for public speaking. The posture is just as important as the words, <laughs> which Cammy and you talk about it's all the time. So true. Like what story is your body telling? Before you even open your mouth. Before you even open your mouth. Wow. So yeah, I, I'm telling you, this do- it's got it all, this documentary. Um, Ugh, I can't wait. It comes from, and it comes wait. from all sources. It comes from the parents. It comes from the teachers. It mm-hmm. comes from the students. The finals... And with the award ceremony where you see how all the different orators fared. And after that, it looks like there's this big old dance party in the auditorium <laughs> right there, like amongst the seats, like the, there's a big conga line and the, that snakes past the judges table. Oh. And, um, it's really, it looks like a total celebration and a real party. And it's people from all over the community then it's different yeah. schools and yeah. districts yeah. and parents and kids yeah. and everyone. Oh my God, yeah. what a unifying It's, it's a really experience. cool thing that the city of Oakland created and has continued to celebrate. Mm -hmm. Um, So last week I spoke with an artist and an educator named Kate Quaffert, who has, who will meet on a make or so. She has done this work with, uh, she's done mask work. She's done oratory and a whole host of other creativities in her classroom, but she likened oratory to mask work. She said that there's something about the experience of putting on a mask. There's this incredible freedom and willingness to experiment because there's a safety, Mm -hmm. not anonymity or hiding, but a melding with the quality of the mask that she has observed frees people. She says that oratory also has this certain deep safety that can come from inhabiting the words of someone else, like a piece of extraordinary writing that has been made to be said out loud, something that the author has honed via like 17 different drafts. 
And by the time that piece of writing gets to the students, it is finely burnished. It carries the resonance of all the people who have heard it. It has weight, it has cultural resonance, and it carries an energy. So when a student memorizes it, gets it into their brain and their body and their heart, there's something deep and important about that. She said, oral narrative is baked into our evolution and oratory mm-hmm. is a space where the art form of oral narrative can live on through these young people. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I thought that way. <laughs> I love Kate Crawford. I'm so happy that you introduced her <laughs> to me and soon all our listeners. I love her But too. I loved She's the way amazing. she talked about it because... Yeah. I was like, yeah, that's it. Yeah. That's, there's really, I thought there was really something to what she was saying. Absolutely. Um, an Irish political leader named James Connolly is quoted by one of the oratorical festival judges in the documentary. The quote is, no revolutionary movement is complete without its poetical expression. No revolutionary wow. movement is complete without its poets and its poetical expression. The judge goes on to say a large part of social movement is art and imagining new just possibilities. The power of the word is all you need is a pen and a piece of paper to share it. And that's where all the magic happens. And I was like, yeah, there is, I feel like it's in our conversation. Maybe I might be misremembering with Donna Lieberman where she talks about every revolution, having those artists That's right. that are Bonnie Siegler too. I was going to say Bonnie talks about it as well. And yeah. with Bonnie, it's like the power of images to convey um, and elicit an emotional response. Um, to help you to understand to help you to something understand in a way that you can take action to yes. feel compelled to, to act. Yes. Um, but then this is like the companion piece to it. It is the words, the spoken words and the power yeah. of oratory to elicit a response and uh, incite people to act. It, it really yeah. can be magical that... The Kate talked about this when she has been present for festivals that have been modeled after this type of oratorical festival. That's right. That the emotional charge in the room is as powerful as any it's gathering incredible. of people she's ever been present for. Um, a judge in the documentary is a, a spoken word artist named Savan Kali Bolt, a Bay Area poet. And Savan Kali says something in the documentary that felt so true to me. Walking into this oratorical festival made me way more hopeful about change coming. Oh. And I felt that way when I watched it. Mm-hmm. It made me way more hopeful about change coming. I feel that way, Sue. It's like, I haven't seen this documentary and I can't wait to, but I have seen these festivals in action, a much smaller scale, like yeah. it, it's not competitive and it doesn't like ladder up to those yeah. finals. Yeah. Um, but it's truly, um, it's extraordinary. Yeah. Like I, I pretty much weep through the whole thing. <laughs> yes. So I actually spoke with a fifth grader named Siri who participated in her school's oratorical festival here in New York Siri had done a group presentation when she was in the fourth grade, and she decided to do a personal presentation when she got to fifth grade. She chose the poem herself. She was looking through a poetry book, and this poem really resonated for her. It was talking about how we're all connected in a way, and that you have to have hope, even when it's hard to have hope. She felt like it would resonate for all kinds of people and translate to everyone who heard it, no matter what they were going through. So she said she prepared it for about a month and a half. She worked on, this is good advice, she worked on it a little bit every day in order to memorize it. It's good creative advice, everybody. And to figure out how to best present it. One of her teachers helped Siri with her preparations. And she said performing her piece at the Oratorical Festival felt kind of magical in a way. Even though she was front in front of an audience, it felt like she was alone. Her poem didn't require that she look at people. She sort of had her eyes lifted up. Um, and Siri described it like floating and talking in her own existence, were mm-hmm. her words. I asked Siri how she felt after she finished sharing her piece, and she said it was hard to describe all the emotions she felt inside. 
Physically and mentally, she felt amazing and terrible at the same time. Amazing because she had done it and survived through it, but terrible because her legs were shaking and she cried for a long time afterwards. Mm. Like after being in such control of her body to deliver her peace afterwards, she didn't have to be in control. Mm. So a lot of feelings came up. And oh. I told her that made sense to me because when something move, it's what you were just saying, Camion, when something moves through you like that powerful self-expression and then maybe the audience goes bananas and you have like some adrenaline and maybe a little cortisol so you can feel shaky legs you can feel weepy eyes you can feel lots and lots and lots of feelings but the more that you experience that the easier it gets to let those feelings pass up and through you and I described it sort of like a good thunderstorm that kind of rolls in and there's lightning and there's thunder and there's a lot of stuff going on and then it sort of concludes the rain tapers off and it rolls out again and you can sort of become stronger and more accustomed to that sort of cycle mm -hmm. in, in your self-expression mm -hmm. even with all the feelings that Siri felt she said that she would definitely do it again she said she honestly she really liked the feeling because it felt like she had done a really big thing mm. i asked siri if she had any advice for a student who might want to participate in an oratorical festival and she said it is a little scary in the beginning and it can feel kind of tricky and if you're doing an established piece you have to remember that these are someone else's words and your job is to honor those words and it's your job to honor the author as a great person and a leader in her experience siri says she didn't need to pay attention to herself so much because she was focused on honoring the words and the person who wrote them. This is fantastic advice. If you have to speak publicly, if you're an actor, sometimes I've really struggled with stage fright. And one of the keys to getting past that was making it not about myself. It's not about mm -hmm. me. It's about it's about my scene partner. It's about the audience. It's about honoring the words of the text that I'm mm -hmm. sharing. So I was mm -hmm. like, oh, out of the mouth of Siri, so, 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 so smart. Siri said she's planning to do another piece in this year's oratorical festival. She's getting ready to pick her poem. The piece Siri did at last year's oratorical festival is entitled A Gift to Sing by James Weldon Johnson. James Weldon Johnson was born in Jacksonville, Florida in 1871, and he was not only a poet, but also a major leader in the NAACP and the first African-American professor to teach at New York University. Mm. There's a spark for you. This is series poem that she recited, The Gift to Sing by James Weldon Johnson. Sometimes the mist overhangs my path and blackening clouds about me cling. But oh, I have a magic way to turn the gloom to cheerful day. I softly sing. And if the way grows darker still, shadowed by sorrow's somber wing, with glad defiance in my throat, I pierce the darkness with a note and sing and sing. I brood not over the broken past, nor dread whatever time may bring. No nights are dark, no days are long, while in my heart there swells a song, and I can sing. Mm. Mm, that one goes out mm, to you, Siri. Siri. I have to say, so good. I think you were in the room to see Siri tell that poem. I was in the room. We may even have a video. I was just we over here do. thinking, can we share this video? We'll check. Her? We have to we have to check with Siri. We have to check, okay. but it brought me to tears. Yeah. Honestly, it was stunning. And she held everyone breathless. Yes. She I've I've watched the video about seven times oh. she's really wonderful she's really, really she nailed wonderful. it she really yeah. really nailed it As she had complete like you were uh describing her talking about having had control over her body she had such control over her body her breath her voice it was masterful i also thought the way that she delivered it and this may have come from her. This may have come from the preparation that she did with mm -hmm. her teacher. But it was so sophisticated. Like it was really, really sophisticated. It was, there was yeah. an understatement to it. I was 
beyond there for it. Yeah. I just thought it was so it's great. Incredible. Yeah, it was pretty wonderful. What do we make of it? What has been made of it? Well, an amazing oratorical festival that yes. is a real point of pride for the city of Oakland. And other, as you were saying, Cam's other oratorical festivals, some of which have been modeled after the MLK Oratorical Festival in Oakland. On the website, Fords.org, they have a great guide for how to host your own oratorical festival. Wow. There are organizational guides, there are study guides, handouts, curriculum, if any of this is sparking you, whether you're a teacher or whether you're a parent or you're, whether you're a student, like if any of this is sparking you, check it out at Fords.org. Um, I'm telling you, We Are the Dream is also sparking me to move to Oakland. Mm. That community seems mm. amazing. Don't know if I can afford it, but wow, it seemed really, really yes. cool. Um, also, Side Spark. Throughout the documentary, they feature all of these gorgeous murals that are mm. all over Oakland. And I was, it, I, wow. that was, that was sparking me in a whole different direction. Yes, yes. So it was, I'm sparked by Siri. Um, I, the, the teachers, it sounds like oh, all the of teachers the, and the it, parents. It is, it yeah. is, um, it's, the, it's a good time. Yeah. It's a really, oh, really, I really good time. I can't wait to watch this. Also, I noticed on the website for the, Oakland's MLK Oratorical Festival, that they they state that they may or may not have the budget due to cuts to give out these mm. small trophies and that it might just be certificates and ribbons. And if you're a parent who wants to purchase a trophy mm -hmm. for your student, mm -hmm. they, they link to vendors. These aren't big trophies. These are yeah. just little teen trophies. Yeah. And I thought... There's a spark. Make a donation so that they can sure. have trophies. Oh my God. Yeah. At the MLK Oratorical sure. Festival. Because work your mind back to when you were young. Yeah. And how much that it matters. matters. Yeah. It matters. Mm. So there's a spark, maybe. That's something we all could do. Yeah. Chip right into the, that. P.S. They don't ask for donations, and I don't even know if they're set up to receive donations, but, but. they do have an address, and mm -hmm. you do have a checkbook, I bet. Oh. Grab your mom's checkbook. JK, JK, JK. <laughs> um, so that's my spark, Cam. Oh, that's a good one. That's an emotional one, I have to say. It brought back a lot of memories of seeing, of like being present for the festival and for Siri. Um, I should it's really good stuff. I should acknowledge though that this spark, I feel like came from you. This <laughs> I learned well, it from you, Dad. Uh, it this, from you. This spark came from you. Um, you were the first person I'd ever heard about this from. Uh, and then I heard it again from Bonnie Siegler because she had done the graphics for the documentary. The dream, yeah. And um so thank you for sliding I'm a spark happy to my share way. A spark. That's what we're doing here. That's what you're what always it's so. All you're about. so great. You're always like there are sparks. There are more There's sparks so than there are for all of us. There, than there is time to process them. So thank you for the spark, hey, Kimian. You are welcome. And now it belongs to all of us, and people can run with it. If you got inspired, please take it and make something. Take of it, it and make it. I guess that's it. We hope this put another <laughs> bunch of sparks in your spark file. Listen, if there's a spark, you. <laughs> I wonder how many times in the average episode of this show we say the word spark. If there is a spark, <laughs> spark, spark you'd like us to explore, or if you've taken a sparkly spark, 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 and fan it into a creative flame, and you'd like to share that, email us at thesparkfile at gmail.com or submit it through our website, thesparkfile.com. We will even happily take your feedback, but you know the price of admission. First, you have to share a creative risk that you have taken recently. It's too true, Camion. You can also follow us on social media and be sure to subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcast. Subscribe, rate, five-star review it. If you like this podcast, share it with people you love. If you didn't like it, there's only about 90 more seconds to go, so hang tight. <laughs> You're going to make it. <laughs> if something tickles your fancy and gets your creative juices flowing, we're writing you a forever permission slip to make that thing that has been knocking at your door. It is your turn to take a spark, spark, spark and fan it into <laughs> a flame. You got to speak it. You got to dancing cheek to cheek it. You got to do like Rick James did and mother up and freak it. You got to take, take it. it. And make, make it. it. Bye. Bye.
sparks, 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 sparks,